Hi, my name is Beth Sinley. I'm a senior group leader at the Imaging Platform at the Broad Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I want to talk to you in this two-part video series about morphological profiling. In part one, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what it is, what are some of the steps to doing it, and why are those steps really important to getting good quality data out at the end. And then in the second part, I'll go through the actual steps that my team does when new morphological data sets come into our lab to turn them into profiles and to be able to explore them for biological insight. And I want to start just from the idea that microscopy analysis used to be about what the human eye could see, and in some cases what the human hand was able to draw. But now our microscopes come attached with digital cameras, which means every picture that we have from those microscopes is ultimately an array of numbers. Even the camera that you have in your phone that's taking the pictures of you and your friends is ultimately just creating mathematical arrays of numbers. And if you think about that from a data perspective, that means now whenever we snap a picture on our microscope, if we have a 2000 by 2000 pixel camera, we have 4 million quantitative pixels. So we have 4 million pieces of mathematical information that we can mine every single snap that you take. And so if you take multiple stains or multiple Z planes or multiple time points, that amount of data just explodes. We have so much information that we can mine for insight. And while a lot of us, including myself, started by just looking for one feature that we knew would be the thing that we could see and that we did want to measure, there's so much more information that's hiding in these images that it turns out can actually give us really interesting biological insight, even if it's not available to the human visual system. So here are some imaging flow cytometer images of a bunch of cells in different cell cycle phases, and except for maybe at the end where these cells are starting to divide, by eye it's incredibly difficult to tell which cell cycle phase each of these cells are in, at least with my human eyes and my human brain. But it turns out if you train an algorithm, which knows actually what the cell cycle phase is from DAPI measurements, but then give the algorithm only the bright field information and say, using only the bright field information, guess what cell cycle phase you're in, it turns out it can do that with pretty astonishing accuracy based on data that human eyes can't detect. And even in cases where the algorithm is getting what we're calling the wrong answer, in places where it's making mistakes that kind of make sense. So S phase, it sometimes thinks it might be G1 or G2, but those are a continuous process to go from G1 to S to G2. And so the fact that it's not quite sure where it is, is just as much an artifact of us needing to put anything into a single discrete bin as it is about the algorithm actually getting a wrong answer. Same thing with G2 and prophase, sometimes getting a bit confused since there is a progression from one stage to the other that isn't necessarily fully switch-like. And so if I put up here just a pretty spinny movie of what these measurements look like when projected into 3D space, you can see the cells are clustering pretty nicely by cell cycle phase. So this mathematical information is present even though our eyes can't detect it. And so this, I think, is an incredibly cool story from some of the early days of morphological profiling. In this case, uh, the researchers had a bunch of different classes of drugs, each of which had several members of the class. So they had several drugs that were actin disruptors, DNA damagers, et cetera, et cetera. What they wanted to know is could they use images in order to figure out for new drugs whether or not they belong to any of these classes. And so the way to do that is to first test whether or not it can take the drugs that they know which class it belongs to and get the right answer. And so they stained cells with a DNA stain, an actin stain, and a tubulin stain. And then they just measured them and created lots of measurements per cell. In this case, about five or 600 measurements per cell. And what they then tried to do was just cluster the, the results that came out based on the different drug classes to see, could you reliably put all of the drugs from the same class back together again? And it turns out using the nucleus alone, you can get 67% accuracy, including really good accuracy in some compartments that you don't even necessarily associate with the nucleus all of the time, like protein synthesis. When you give it three channels worth of measurements, you get 94% accuracy. And similar to what I said with the cell cycle phases, some of the mistakes that it's making kind of make sense 
For example, DNA damage and DNA replication are incredibly intertwined processes, and so it's pretty natural that the algorithm would make some mistakes between those two things. So results like these led the Carpenter Lab and the Schreiber Lab at, here at the Broad Institute to create what they call the cell painting assay. And the idea of the cell painting assay is actually pretty simple. It's let's fit as many stains as we can onto a standard high content microscope to stain as many parts of the cell as we can so that we can just measure even more than five or 600 measurements. But now we routinely measure about five to 6,000 measurements per cell. And then we can take that really simple assay, which is designed to also be as inexpensive as possible, and look at the differences between, say, healthy or diseased patient cell lines, or controls and drugs, or genetic perturbations like overexpressions or knockdowns. We do whatever our perturbations are, we collect all of our samples, we add this set of dyes, and then we find cells and measure them as richly as we can. Once we have all of these measurements, we can start doing clustering, and that clustering might tell us really interesting information about the relationships between all of our samples. And so this is one of my favorite examples, actually, of the successes of this technique. In this paper, the researchers were cell painting cells that were overexpressing lots of different human genes, some of which were wild type and some of which had known mutations. And so we have genes from lots of different pathways here, and if we zoom in, it'll be a little easier to see that the genes are clustering pretty nicely by pathways. And so here we have a number of members of the RAF-RAS pathway. The cases where we have two copies of the allele are being matched directly to each other, and members that are part of the same pathway are being put in the same cluster. And I think what's the coolest thing of all here is that we have some constitutionally active disease-causing mutations of members of these pathways, and they are put in the very next cluster over. So cell painting, even though it's not specific to anything in the RAF-RAS pathway, can see that not only do members of that pathway belong together, but that mutants in that pathway are similar, but not the same. And so there's a lot of information in this paper that I won't go into. I definitely recommend that you check it out. But it was able to discover lots of known pathway-pathway connections and lots of known pathways being grouped together by cell painting. And while it's always really good and gratifying to have your technique validated by finding things you know to be true, uh, they're also able to find that there was a pathway-pathway interaction between some of the genes that were overexpressed that were members of the NF-kappa B pathway and some that were ex overexpressed from the HIPPO pathway, and their cell painting profiles looked extremely anti-correlated. Basically what I'm saying is that when features went up for one set, they went down for the other. And so because they were so strongly anti-correlated, we wondered, are these pathways actually opposing each other in the cells? Now there wasn't really literature support for this idea, but so able to, when we looked at a reporter of the HIPPO pathway, we were able to say that when NF-kappa B pathway genes are overexpressed, the HIPPO reporter goes way down. And so we're actually able to discover novel pathway-pathway interactions in biology just from saying that the image profiles of these in the cell painting assay were anti-correlated. So while this technique really works, I do want to give a few caveats and disclaimers of what's important to get right before you're able to do these sorts of experiments. For starters, in order for this analysis to work, you need your segmentation, and by that I mean your object finding. I'll mostly refer to cells throughout this in the next video, but for you, your object that you care about and want to segment could be a whole organism, a part of a cell, or really anything else. But whatever you're trying to segment and find, that your segmentation is good enough, that it's mostly pretty accurate. Otherwise, these techniques won't work. It's equally important that it's not just good enough in your negative controls, but also in your positive controls, or your most extreme expected conditions. Um, you want to be sure that when you have a difference between two different samples, that that difference is coming from the fact that there's a biological difference and not from the fact that one is segmented well and one is segmented poorly. We have a blog post here in the video description for guidelines about how we design some of these and how we decide when to stop designing and move forward and do the analysis. And I also want to say that doing the level of comparison that I'm going to show today is typically just the beginning. It's just the starting point. What's going to be most crucial to do is to look at your data, 
And this is true at the image stage where you need to check your segmentation and make sure that it's good. But also, once you've made what you think is an interesting biological discovery from the data, you need to dig into the data as well more carefully. So here are 13 data sets that actually show the same means and standard deviations and Pearson correlations. I'm going to talk more about Pearson correlations in just a few minutes. But actually, when you plot them, just x versus y against one another, come in lots of really different sizes and shapes, including a dinosaur. And so profiling techniques like the ones I'm going to show you are good places to get started about where, what kinds of relationships you might have between different samples but you always want to dig further into the data and not just stop there. The final caveat that I'll say is that profiling is an entire discipline in its own right. I'm sure that by the time I finish making this video, someone will have made a new discovery in this area that will make parts of it obsolete. So it's an incredibly rich and evolving field, and I'm showing you just a tiny piece of it. But with that being said, Here's what we actually do to get started when we do this routinely in our lab. So what do we actually do? How do we actually examine profiles? So in this and the next video, I'm gonna be using a tool called Morpheus, which is written by a different group here at the Bird Institute and looking at what's called a similarity matrix. I'm gonna take a couple minutes to go into the math of what a similarity matrix is not because necessarily this is a video about math, but because understanding how these sorts of graphs are made is going to be critical to you understanding what it looks like when things go right and when things didn't go right. So what is a similarity matrix? Here we have measurements from a, sing from a few wells from a single plate. You can see we have lots of different kinds of measurements, things that are related to area, things related to intensity, things related to texture, etc. If we narrow our thinking to just two wells, say well B2 and well C2, we can take these columns of information and just plot them against one each other, x versus y, to see basically how often when one goes up does the other go up, or when one goes down the other goes down. And in this case, well B2 and well C2 are very well correlated. They have a Pearson correlation of 0.90. Now of course there are lots of other measures you can use besides Pearson, but Pearson's where we typically get started. So we can take that 0 0.90 association between B2 and C2 and then go one step bigger. So we can do that correlation between every pair of wells. And so here I have the similarity matrix for the set of wells. And if we look at the intersection of B2 and C2, we see that we still get the same 0 0.90 answer, but we can now see how B2 relates to C5 or C2 to D6 or any pair that we want. The diagonal here, which is each well compared to itself, is always going to be 1, which in this heat map is red and negative 1 is blue. But we can then start seeing, do we see clusters where things have really high correlation or really low correlation in a way that's interesting to us? Now I said that we're starting from per well means here. So why are we doing that? Why aren't we looking at individual cell measurements? Well, mostly because in practice it makes things way easier. It's easier to look at a 3D4 by 3D4 matrix from a 3D4 wall plate than the about 1 million cells we typically get from an individual plate, so a million by a million matrix. There's also a lot of heterogeneity within cells, which would make it hard to do those sorts of clusterings in a way that really is tractable because for example, we'll have mitotic cells in each well that probably are going to look most similar to other mitotic cells than to, say, the G1 or the G2 cells. Now, I talked about subpopulations and cell cycle phases there. By taking a mean of all of the cells in a well, we're, we know we're averaging across those things, and we know we're going to miss changes in subpopulations, which is why this is just one tool in our toolkit of doing comparisons between groups. But with this with this tool, we can do analyses to find major systemic changes. So we start by go looking at per well means. The next thing we do is we actually normalize each feature. And I'm not going to go into how we normalize it in terms of selecting whether we do it to all data or to negative controls. It's outside the scope of this video. But I'd like to actually now take you into Morpheus to do a demonstration as to why this is really critical in order for this technique to work. So here we have the Morpheus interface. I'm going to bring in my per well data that hasn't been normalized. 
and it's stored in the form of a GCT file. When I load it in, I appreciate that all of the rows are different features or measurements. And what may be hard to appreciate right now is that all of the columns are individual wells. If I go to this gears icon, I can change this from ID to something that's a little bit more helpful by going to the annotations tab. And I can, for example, change this to plate, well, and compound. I can add as many metadata features here as I would like. You can add colors or shapes to each one. I like adding colors. One thing that colors make nice is that when you then start sorting things, which I can do by just clicking, which is going to sort forwards, then backwards, then unsort, it becomes really clear what's associating with what, especially when you have a lot of samples. Here we have about 600 that we've subselected from a much larger experiment. So if I go ahead and just make a similarity matrix for this data set, which I can go to Tools, Similarity Matrix, and as I mentioned before, we typically do Pearson correlation, I can choose whether or not I want to do it for the rows, which would essentially give me how similar each feature is to each other, or for the columns, which is essentially how similar is each well to each other. That's what we care about for right now. And when I do that, rather than the, the blue and red that you saw in the examples that I just showed, what you see here is that we have one giant chunk of red. And when I hover over the values, all of my values are essentially around one. At the lowest, they're something like 0.5. So again, this looks very different than what I was previously showing you. So why is that? To make sense of it, I think it helps to go into looking tr looking at these as charts in just the same way as we did before with graphing thing columns against each other in x and y so to do that in morpheus i'm going to just select by shift clicking all of the rows or i could have just taken a subset if i wanted i'm going to grab a couple columns from this plate Again, I can either shift or command click individual ones. And I'm going to grab two that are DMSO and one that is not DMSO, just so that we can see the difference. So let's now go into Morpheus's charting tool and see what we see. So the first thing I'm going to do is a column profile, which is just to say as we go down each column, what is the value and just sort of plot it out as a straight line. I'm going to change the color here so that we see it with the well name. And what you'll probably appreciate is that, first of all, these seem very similar as we go down the profiles. There are some places where the black and the red sort of peek out from behind the teal that's drawn on top, but for the most part, these are pretty tightly co-varying. And so that explains why we're seeing such a positive similarity matrix, because things are co-varying as we go down. This isn't actually uh, good representation, the similarity matrix is actually representing what's going on. The other thing you'll probably appreciate is that we have long areas where the features tend to stay as pretty low numbers, and then we spike into bigger numbers in the hundreds or even in the thousands. If I swap now to a scatter plot and turn on my ability to take a look at the feature name as I hover over individual dots, this will make sense when you start thinking about what actually in Cell Profiler each feature does. So the biggest number that we have for this is area. An area can be up to any number of square pixels that you want, whereas some measurements like the mean intensity or the number of neighbors or the eccentricity are going to be things that are around 0 and 1. Probably a cell doesn't have 2,000 or 3,000 neighbors it probably just has one or two. And intensities in cell profile are all scaled zero to one. And so most of our things like mean intensity are going to be down in this realm. And so we are seeing very large correlations between all of our wells. But it's not anything to do with the fact that these cells look very similar or very different. It just has to do with the fact that the features look very similar or very different because they haven't been normalized. And this is why normalization is so critical.
Now, why didn't we see this before? It doesn't look apparently like the features are all that different when I look at this view. So here, 5.47 is blue. Here, 9.98 .9 is red. But here, red is 0.61. So what is possibly going on here? Well, so Morpheus has helpfully put us into a relative color scheme, saying that it's going to take the minimum and maximum of all of the values in each row and, tr and individually scale the colors in that row so that it always has some blue and some red. That's helpful if you want to just sort of take a look at what's going up and what's going down, but that's what hid the fact that we had our features in all sort of different value ranges. Thankfully, it's pretty easy to change and to get rid of that and to just have this data be normalized, and we can do this within Morpheus. You can also do it outside of Morpheus, which is what we actually typically do with the Python tool. We'll talk more about that in video too. But if I go into my tools menu here and I just go to adjust, I can pick a robust disease score. And now my values are seem to be smaller and seem to be mostly in sort of the negative one to one range, maybe sort of negative two to two. If I go back to my charting tool, to reselect my rows and columns. So I'm going to grab the same ones as last time. Now when I do my column profile, now we can see that things are centered around zero and are when they go up only going up and down as much as sort of negative six to six. And so now we're in a much tighter range of things, but each the differences between features have now been factored out by our normalization. I'm gonna turn this color back to well again and go back to looking at this uh, column scatter matrix and label the compound on the axis. And I'm doing this because we have two DMSO columns and one non-DMSO column. And so when we're matching DMSO to DMSO, what we see is we still actually have a pretty tight correlation. These values are actually pretty similar. But our DMSO to some drug is now not correlated. And so with normalization, we've taken it where the only thing we're able to see is the sort of range of values for a particular feature to now actually being able to do some biological insight. Finally, once we've normalized our data, the last thing we do before we move on is to select a subset of features. Now, why do we do that? I just spent some time telling you that you should get lots of measurements and create lots of them and that we do five or 6,000. So why are we now then narrowing that funnel? Let's go back to Morpheus to take a look. So let's now return to this data we, where we just normalized all of our features in Morpheus. The other data is still there, but I'm going to close it just so that we don't get confused. And our old Pearson correlation, which was not that helpful, is still there. And we're still in the data set where now we're in a range of sort of negative six to six. So if I do a similarity matrix now with our normalized values for columns as we did before, What you'll see is we now have a mixture of blue and red and white, which is what we were hoping to see. I'm not going to go too much into whether or not this biologically makes sense right now, but at least the graph looks the way it's supposed to. But right now we're thinking about feature selection, and so I want to actually do the other similarity matrix, which is to look at the similarities between uh, individual features and individual measurements. So I'm going to go back to the similarity matrix tool, and instead of performing a Pearson correlation for columns, I'm going to do it for rows. So here's my row similarity matrix. I'm going to do a couple things to make this easy to look at. And the major one is just to say that I want to link the rows and columns so that if I sort on the x-axis, it will also sort on the y-axis, and so those always stay linked. So now that my 
columns are locked to my rows, let's zoom way out. Let's go to fit to window. So here, as with our other similarity matrix, we do have a lot of blues and reds. And blues in this case aren't bad, and whites in this case aren't bad, because what they're saying is that certain features are anti-correlated or just not that correlated at all. But we do have quite a lot of bright red. And so to make it even easier to visualize some things here, I'm going to change my color scheme. So right now Morpheus is sort of smoothly doing everything negative one to one. What I'm going to do is say that from negative point, from negative one to negative point nine, it can be blue, but then it should be white. And I can just get that by setting all of these to 255. So set that to negative 0.9. And I'm going to do the same thing with this one here, except I'm going to put it at positive 0.9. And again, set the color to white. And so what this is going to do is this is going to let me see which features are either extremely strongly anti-correlated, have an absolute value of correlation of above 0.9 in this direction or in this direction. And that's important because if we have a lot of features that are giving us the same piece of information, the Pearson correlation when we do our similarity matrix is using them in an additive way. So it is saying that, for example, here's, there, there's a good section. So this so this chunk of features here is all basically 100% correlated. And what these all are, are basically slightly different ways to measure the diameter or the radius. So we have the maximum radius, the mean radius, the median radius, the minimum diameter, which again, diameter and, radi and radius aren't the same, but they should be highly correlated, and the axis length, which again, is basically like a radius or a diameter. And so we have essentially five different ways of measuring the exact same thing. Now, when we do our Pearson similarity matrix for columns, and we then say how similar is each column to each other column, if the cell's diameter has changed, we're going to essentially get that value times five. So it's essentially saying that the diameter of the cell is five times more important than any other measurement, like the perimeter or the orientation. And you can imagine where that starts getting problematic because we don't want certain features to count for more than other ones, at least not just because they're measured similarly. If I go back to my raw data and I go to filter my rows, I'll show you how extreme this can get. If I want something to do with neighbors, I have, only, I have 30 measurements total across cells and nuclei. But if I want to look at something to do with texture, I have almost 200 features. Now, is texture seven times more important than the number of cells nearby? I can't say that for sure, but by not feature selecting, I'm putting my thumb on the scale and saying, that texture is seven times more important than neighbors, and that the radius of a cell is five times more important than its orientation. And so that's going to pose a problem when really just what we want to look at is an unbiased view of differences. So there are a couple of different ways that I can handle this. One is I can just understand that that's what's happening, and I can just say, all right, well, I understand things aren't being treated equally, but for the purposes of what I want to do right now, 
it will give me an idea of where things are extremely up or extremely down. You can see here that our, our matrix isn't bad. We, have, we still have lots of things sort of correlated and anti-correlated. I can manually remove some features. So since I can filter the features that are allowed to be in each row, I could remove some of the ones you know, by looking here and saying what is co well correlated with everything else. I could say, all right, well, I know that I don't need these other measures of radius because I already have one. And I could go through and I could sort of hand curate my feature list to try and remove all of the unbalance so that everything comes back into balance again. But when you have, you know, 500 features, and again, we're often now in the range of 5,000 to 6,000, that's going to become really a problem. It's going to become extremely difficult to hand remove all of those features. So in practice, we really want to do this at the command line, which we'll talk more about in part two. But hopefully it now becomes clear why this is a step we need to do. In conclusion, Morphological profiling can be a really powerful way to explore cellular phenotype data and to learn connections between different phenotypes, whether your phenotypes are related to patients or chemicals or genes or anything else. And you don't have to do anything particularly special in order to do these sorts of analyses other than make lots of measurements. And so whether you find your objects of interest in cell profiler or some other software, just add as many measurements as you can think of. Add lots and lots and lots of measurements and you never know what you may be able to mine using techniques like this in order to make cool discovery. And by collapsing, normalizing, and feature selecting our data, we can take millions of cells and turn them into something that's easily explored with point and click open source tools so that we can generate biological insight. Thanks for watching this video. I hope that's given you a lot of insight into what profiling is. And in video two, we will look at how profiling is actually done.